In this video, I want to try to give you a deeper understanding for how the softmax function works. And hopefully I'll be able to show you something about it that you hadn't realized before. So in machine learning, the softmax function is often used to transform the outputs from the last layer of your neural network into probabilities. And these might be probabilities for classifying a certain type of image, for example. So here, if we imagine these four dots with the outputs from our neural network, and they were trying to classify, for example, what type of fruit was in an image. And let's say we only had four classes. Here, the red is for a red apple. Orange is for an orange. Green is for a green apple. And blue is for a blueberry. So if this were the outputs from our model, then the model would most likely think the picture is of a blueberry. Basically, the farther to the right the output is for a certain class, the more likely the model thinks the input data is for that class. And the outputs from the model can be anywhere on the number line, from in between negative infinity to infinity. So the question is, how do we convert those numbers into probabilities? And that's what the softmax function can be used for. So how the softmax function works is it takes each of these values, and then it takes this function e to the x, and it sees where each of these points would fall on this function. Then we take the height of each of these lines corresponding to each class, and we add them up to get our total height, which is this dashed line here. You can also see on the right here, each of these bars will be the height of each of these lines, and then this bar will be the total of all of them added together. And then our final probabilities for each of these classes will just be the height of its line divided by the total height of all these heights added together. So we can see as we move around these input points, not only does moving this point change the height of this line, but it also changes the height of the total. So to better see how this is actually going to change the probabilities of each of these points, we can squash this graph down so that the height of the total always has a height of 1. So I've added that down here below. It basically takes this portion of the graph and we'll just squash it down. So now this dashed line is always 1 above this baseline. Then each of these heights of the colored dashed lines will be the probability for that class. So now we can see if we move around one of these inputs on this bottom graph, the total height will remain the same, and the graph will just be more or less squashed depending on what the total height was up here. So now if we just expand this graph a bit so it makes it a bit easier to see what's happening down here, we might ask, as we move one of these points, what type of path does it follow? And if we plot its path, we can see that it is the sigmoid function. And basically, whatever point is moving, that point will follow a sigmoid function. So here's the red one, here's the orange, and all the other ones will adapt to the change in that value. And here's green, and here is the blue. And here we can see the paths that all the points follow as the red dot changes. So these dots with the holes in them will have the same x position as the red line, but they'll have the same height as the height for their class. And as we move the red dot, we can see that not only does its height move in a sigmoid function, but so do the heights of the other classes. They're just moving in the opposite direction. So as red moves up in a sigmoid pattern, all the other classes will move down in a similar sigmoid pattern, just scaled down to what the height of that class would be if red basically had a height of zero. So that's the first insight. If we increase the input value for a certain class, its output probability will move along an increasing sigmoid path. And all the other classes will move in a decreasing sigmoid path. Now another key aspect of the softmax function is that if you shift all the inputs by the same amount, it actually won't change the output probabilities. So here we can see as we move the shift value, which just increases or decreases all the input values by the same amount, down here the probabilities aren't changing. And the reason why that happens is that if, for example, we add 1 to all the input values, that will have the effect of multiplying the height of each of these values by e. And since the total is just the height of all of these added together, it'll also have the effect of multiplying the height of the total by e. So if each of the values increase by a multiple of e, and the total also increases by a multiple of e, when we take those values and divide it by the total, they actually won't change at all. Another interesting effect is that if instead of adding the same value to all the inputs, if we instead multiply a certain value times all the inputs, 
For example, down here, our multiply factor, we can see as we increase the multiple above one, it'll spread out the probabilities. And as we decrease the multiple towards zero, it will clump up the probabilities. So this is often used in machine learning as a parameter called the temperature, and it will change the randomness of the outputs. So the more similar the output probabilities are, the more it kind of represents a uniform distribution. And in a sense, the more random it will be. Whereas the more spread out the probabilities are, the more likely that one class will get the majority of the probability, and it will be less random, more deterministic. So with this type of graph, we can kind of see if these are our input values, what will our output probabilities look like? But what if we wanted to see what all the output probabilities look like over the entire input space? So that's what we'll try to do now to try to get a better idea for how the input space to the softmax function gets transformed into probabilities. So here we'll start off by looking at a softmax for two input classes. So along this x-axis, we're increasing the input value for one of the classes, and along this y-axis, we're increasing the input value for one of the other classes. And we can see the shape we get is basically two sigmoid functions going in the opposite direction. And we can increase the height of this just to get a better idea of what it looks like. And as we saw previously, when we increase all the input values or decrease them by the same amount, that won't have effect on the probabilities. So here on this graph, increasing all the values by a certain amount corresponds to moving parallel along this diagonal. And as we can see, if we just looked straight down the diagonal, these probabilities don't change at all. And now if we bring these heights back down to their normal levels, we can also look at the gradients to the inputs of the softmax function if we use the typical categorical loss of the negative log likelihood. So here we can see if the true class was for what this pink label represents, it would be pushed this way. And if the true class was for this blue label, it would be pushed this way. And now let's look at how we can interpret these probabilities. And I talked about this a bit in my previous video about the sigmoid function, but it also applies here. So for example, we can imagine if we had two leaky pipes way up in the air and they were each dripping drops of water, then we can model where that drop will hit the ground pretty closely by a Gaussian distribution. And in this case, a two-dimensional Gaussian distribution. And let's say drops falling from this other pipe would fall over here in a similar two-dimensional Gaussian distribution. So if we have these two distributions and we see a drop fall right here, and we want to know what's the probability that drop came from the left pipe versus the right pipe, then we can apply Bayesian inference and just say the probability it came from the left pipe will be the height of this probability curve for the left pipe divided by the height of both of the curves added together. And if we now do that for all points in this plane, applying the same rule, the shape we actually get is the same shape we get with the softmax. So the only difference might be the slope of these sigmoid functions. And we can see how they change depending on how these Gaussian distributions change. So for example, if we increase the variance, we will lower the slope of those lines. And if we decrease the variance, making those sharper, it'll increase the slope of this line. Also, we can see if we move them farther apart, it'll increase the slope of the line. And if we move them closer together, it'll decrease the slope of that line. And one thing to note is that these Gaussian distributions can be anywhere along this diagonal, and we'll get the same output probabilities, which won't vary along this diagonal. So this is the example for two classes, and it's actually the same as just a sigmoid function. But now to really see how the softmax differs, let's take it to three classes. And one thing we'll have to keep in mind is this fact that as we move along the diagonal, our probabilities won't change. So in this example, if we were just to look at a slice that was perpendicular to this diagonal, we would get all the information we needed to know. Basically, we could extrapolate that as we move those probabilities up and down along this diagonal, they would be the same. So we're gonna use that same idea to plot what the probabilities would look like for a three-dimensional input. So here's the softmax for three classes. So now we have three axes, and as we move along one, we're increasing the input value for that class. And here we're only looking at a 2D slice of the entire input space. But because that 2D slice is perpendicular to the diagonal of these three axes, if we move that plane up or down, the probabilities shown here would be the same. And if we rotate this graph around, we can see it just evenly divides the space. And if we increase the height of it, we can get a better understanding of the internals of this space. So just as we saw before, when you increase the input for a certain class, 
you're going to increase the output for that class moving along a sigmoid curve and also moving along a decreasing sigmoid curve for the other classes. Now, if we decrease the height back down to its normal height, we can again look at what the derivatives would be on the input values to the softmax function, given that we're using the typical categorical loss of the negative log likelihood. And here we're looking at the gradient for the pink class, and we see these two kind of flat slopes that would essentially try to push that input value in the direction that would most increase the probability for that class. And here's what it looks like if we look at the gradients for all three different classes at the same time. And just as before, we can make the same relationship with Gaussian distributions. So here, instead of two, we have three Gaussian distributions, and they equally divide this 2D space. And if we apply Bayes' rule to the blue class here, we can see we get the same curve as the softmax function. And the only thing that will vary is the steepness of this curve, depending on the variance of these Gaussian distributions and how far spread out they are. So now let's look at an example with actually training a neural network. So we'll start with some input points that look like this. So we have three classes, one for blue, one for pink, and one for yellow. And you can see the blues are kind of clumped over here, the pinks are kind of clumped over here, and the yellows are distributed kind of around the outside of all the points, like a shell. And we're gonna to try to use a neural network to kind of untangle the space and convert it into a space that can be passed through a softmax function to predict what classes these input values are for. So the neural network we'll use is just gonna be two hidden layers, each of a size of 32, and the last layer will have its weights and biases initialized to zero, which is something that's commonly done to generate the logits that are gonna be passed into the softmax function. So if we plot where these logits all start out, it's just at the same point, 0, 0, 0 in the input space to the softmax function. But after we train the model with stochastic gradient descent, we can see how the position of these logits changed over time as the model was trained. And we can see it spreads it out into these three different classes, up here for yellow, down here for pink, and over here for blue. But if we look along the plane that's perpendicular to the diagonal of all three of the axes, we can see that all our logits still fall on that same plane. And that's because if we move in a direction perpendicular to this plane, it won't change the probabilities at all. So we won't have a gradient in any of those directions. Now this is true if we're using stochastic gradient descent without momentum, but if we use an optimization algorithm that has momentum-like parameters, we won't necessarily have all our logits on this single plane because the parameters in the model may not always move in the direction of the gradient. For example, here's what the logits look like if we train with the Adam optimization algorithm. And you can see the logits no longer stay on that same plane. Some of them will swerve off it, but the fact that they move off this plane won't change the probabilities of those logits when it goes through the softmax function. It's just kind of a side effect of the optimization algorithm. So now just for fun, we can try to imagine what the softmax function would look like for four classes. And just as in the example with three classes, we can take a two-dimensional slice of that perpendicular to the diagonal of those three axes and look at how it transforms that space. And it basically transforms that space by evenly dividing it into three separate areas and then smoothly transitioning between those areas with sigmoid-like curves. So we can extrapolate that to a case with four classes and we can look at a three-dimensional slice across that four-dimensional space and what we would see is a three-dimensional space that would be evenly divided into four spaces. And that would essentially look like this shape right here. It's kind of a three-sided pyramid, and we have one, two, three, four different spaces. And the probabilities as we shift between these spaces would be smooth sigmoid curves. And again here, we could apply the relationship with the Gaussian distributions. Here we would have three-dimensional Gaussian distributions, and they would be distributed evenly in these spaces divided up by this shape. And now to try to take it even one step further, we can try to imagine what a softmax function would look like for five classes. So we can start by trying to extrapolate from this four class example, where if we take 2D slices of this three-dimensional space and we move it up and down, we can see that at the top, it's just equally divided into three spaces as we had with our three class softmax. But as we move this plane down, we'll see that down here, it starts to open up the middle section 
for our fourth class. And I think that same kind of idea can be applied to the case with five classes. So with five classes, we would be looking at the four-dimensional slice of that 5D space that was perpendicular to the diagonal of those five axes. And if we move that 4D slice along that diagonal, the probabilities wouldn't change. So now, what would the probabilities in that 4D slice look like? And if we try to imagine taking 3D slices of that 4D space, we can imagine that at one end, those slices would look similar to our case with four classes, which would create a shape similar to the one seen here. Then as we move those slices across the 4D space, at one point, we'd start to see the center of the shape open up, and that would be our fifth class starting to come into play. At least, I think this is what would happen. I'm not super comfortable with geometry in higher dimensions, so if you are someone who knows more about what this shape would look like in higher dimensions, let me know in the comments to let me know if I was wrong or right. So feel free to check the comments to see if anyone has confirmed or denied this hypothesis. Anyways, I hope this video helped give you a deeper intuition for the softmax function and how it's really only dividing a subspace of the entire input space. So for example, if we have three classes, we're evenly dividing a two-dimensional space into three different classes. And that's kind of a cool idea, that no matter how many dimensions you have, that space can be evenly divided by a number one more than the number of dimensions of that space. So for example, a 100-dimensional space can be evenly divided into 101 separate subspaces, and each of those subspaces will be symmetric. Anyways, I thought that was cool, and I thought the relationship between the softmax and these evenly divided Gaussian distributions was helpful. It's basically the idea that as our networks are training, they're trying to push these logit values towards those Gaussian distributions, and moving those logits in the direction parallel to the diagonal of the axes of that space won't change the probabilities at all. So I hope you found that interesting too. And as always, I'll have links in the description to not only the code, but these visualizations for the Desmos 2D graphs and these GeoGebra 3D graphs that you can play with if you want. And that's all for this video. I'll see you guys next time.